So uh, it's, it's so good to see so many of you from the Lutheran Services in America community and our friends and partners. So thank you to, for joining us for today's discussion uh, about the critical role that faith-based health and human service organizations and leaders like you play in advancing effective public policies, particularly in, here in Washington, D.C. Um, before we get started, for those of you who may not know um, much about Lutheran Services in America, we're a national network of nearly 300 Lutheran social ministries united in our shared faith tradition of service and community and advancing health and opportunity for all people. So across the 1,400 communities uh, in which our work has a presence, working with one in 50 people living in America every year, we lead in helping older adults age with dignity and choice, strengthening children and families, and expanding affordable housing, welcoming more people into our democracy, and breaking intergenerational poverty. So like so many faith traditions and faith communities, the Lutheran tradition includes centuries of service to others. In fact, the long arc of faith-based service and community is a bedrock of our nation's social and economic fabric. As we all know, faith-based providers in the US especially fill gaps in government-funded services, care for the hardest to reach and the most vulnerable, and bring spiritual resources to bear. Increasingly, this also means leading the development of innovative solutions to improve outcomes and address systemic barriers. So I also want to say that Lutheran Services in America is a member of the Interfaith Roundtable, which represents a diversity of faiths. And we are joined uh, today by several of these partners as well. So welcome and so glad you could be with us. So as the size and the scope of the federal government has grown, so too, thankfully, have efforts to ensure that faith-based organizations have a seat at the table. Today, I am thrilled that we are hosting two esteemed leaders in this movement, Dr. John DiULio and Dr. Stanley carson -Tease. So welcome to you both, and thank you for spending the afternoon with us. Thank when you. the George W. Bush administration sought to translate candidate Bush's focus on compassionate conservatism into action by creating a new office in the White House focused on faith-based concerns, they called in Dr. DiULio to run it and Dr. Carson Tease to help lead it. As successive administrations have evolved these efforts, both John and Stanley, as they're commonly referred to here, have been local and vocal advocates working to level the playing field for faith-based organizations and expanding faith-based partnerships across a wide range of issues, agencies, administrations, and civic partners. So by way of formal introduction, um, Dr. DiULio is a Frederick Fox Leadership Professor of Politics, Religion, and Civil Society at the University of Pennsylvania. You can Google him and he's written a lot of articles. I've, uh, I've, I shared a few of them last week in my CEO connection. He has served as the founding faculty director of UPenn's Robert A. Fox Leadership Program and Partnership for Effective Public Administration and Leadership. He is the author, co-author, or editor of more than a dozen books, including Bringing Back the Bureaucrats and Godly Republic, a centrist blueprint for America's faith-based future. So welcome again, John. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, doc yes, so much. And, and Dr. Carlson Tees is director of the Institutional Religious Freedom Alliance at the Center for Public Justice. He is co-author of Free to Serve, Protecting the Religious Freedom of Faith-Based Organizations, served in the Butch White House Faith-Based Office, and advised the Obama Faith-Based Initiative. So welcome again, Stanley. So today, just to give you a quick bit of the lay of the land, um, they will walk us through some of the federal evolution in this space from their unique vantage points and discuss the current state of affairs. We will have ample time for Q&A, so please get your questions ready and feel free to put them in the chat and um, Kent Mitchell and I will um, help bring those to the forefront. So in closing, um, I will share my own hopes for this session. And it is my hope that we all emerge with an expanded understanding and a renewed commitment to making a broad array of faith-based voices heard in Washington, DC, so we can create more com caring communities everywhere for all people. So please use the chat to join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. DiULio and Dr. Carlson Thies, and I turn the call over to them. John and Stanley, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. That was a great overview uh, introduction. Uh, or... Stan, I defer to you. You're the man. Okay. Stan the man. Right. You're from yeah. Stan the man first. <laughs> yeah, I, I got that a lot growing up. And then I, most people I got to stop doing it except for John. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, really honored to be uh Part of this discussion. I'm glad that you do it as a periodic, um, a regular discussion. Uh, seems really critical to me. And we're in a doing space, it's really important to have time to reflect, um, particularly with others. Um, I think people who spend a lot of time reflecting don't often get the same opportunity to be doers, which would actually help correct the reflection, probably. Um, but that's a, another whole discussion, I think. So I thought I would uh, give a, a brief sketch of the Faith-Based or Partnership Initiative, uh, its significance, its trajectory, um, with an emphasis on its two and a half decades ago, and then a present status. So just kind of like two endpoints, and just a, a few pieces, and then make two suggestions for how that's and the other organizations. And I wanted to start with a pub, which um, perhaps you've had yourself. Why all the fuss about the faith-based initiative anyway? Supposedly, this is a grand policy and in innovation that makes it possible for religious organizations to receive government dollars to provide services, right? Some people thought we in the White House sat there handing out dollars to whoever came to our door and that we could befriend, but it's not that, but it, it is about, in part, about government funding of private organizations, including religious ones. However, even before the faith-based initiative got started in 96 or 2001, uh, two different uh, important start dates, uh, even before it got started, uh, the typical way that government provided social services, housing, medical services, and more was by awarding government funds to private organizations Catholic Charities, Salvation Army, uh, Lutheran uh, Services, Jewish organizations, and many more. Uh, they were often called religiously affiliated organizations, and they partnered with various federal, state, and local government programs to bring needed help to communities and families and individuals. That was already going on. So why is there a need for a faith-based initiative? What could that possibly have meant? So Turning to that, I just wanted to, to note and stress, I think we, we already uh, heard them, but to stress some vital qualities of the services that LSA members offer, and I think all faith-based organizations take this approach. It's not proselytizing, it's not discriminating against people because of their religion, lack of religion, and different religion, but there is a uh, faith at the core there's a sensitivity to religion, to spirituality. Um, these are organizations committed to, quote, advancing whole person health, including offering spiritual research. And this is not kind of distant services from people, but rather walking next to them, asset-based, um, empowering approaches, um, connecting with people and drawing them into networks and, and befriending them and all of those kinds of things. Uh, so important qualities of LSA organizations and services in mind, and then thinking about why the faith-based organization, I think those qualities are admirable and are exactly what I would want to see in the different social services that tax dollars and donation dollars support. Uh, there are other things, making sure there are checks out there and there are anti-discrimination requirements the government does and supporting industry and many different kinds of things. When, uh, helping people who are marginalized and, and need assistance, then something like those qualities seem to me really important. But those weren't the qualities that the government funding system had been looking for in the days before the faith-based initiative. That previous system has been called Nonprofits for Hire, and which the government specified government style services. I think that's one way to think about it. Uh, after all, it was government money. So what would those services 
standardized, they're arm's length, they're specified from the top down, they're not relational, not so much empowering and asset-based as kind of a set of services and goods and dollars intended to make up for something that's lacking in somebody. <clears throat> you know, you're missing this and, and here's some hours of service uh, to fulfill that. That's a very different than asset-based and relational and alongside people. And then of course, uh, those services couldn't be religious. It couldn't be spiritual. Uh, that's what can offer. So if they're classified, then they wouldn't be religious. So I think it's fair to say that the religious organizations, to lesser degrees, had to turn themselves into religiously affiliated organizations, basically setting aside their religious identity and religion-inspired practices, um, even setting aside their localism and community weren't the valued parts of the relationship. The money was intended for government style services. So by the 1990s, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the outcome kind of system. Um, social services that were too government style, too standardized, too top, too secular. So that Bill Clinton and Congress took up federal welfare in the middle of the 1990s, there was this opportunity for a different kind of model to be put into that process. So it was, it was welfare reform, but it was kind of symbolic for a different way the government might faith-based, community-based organizations with private organizations. More of a partnership model designed to combine the distinctive strengths of nonprofit and faith-based organizations with the government's strengths. The government has a lot of strengths of, of financing and and standardization, making sure everybody has access to service and being systematic and coordinating. Um, but how to combine that with the very distinctive strengths of nonprofits that are individualized and relational and local and, and faith-based. Faith so no longer to be nonprofits but for hire, but rather partners for service was the idea. And I, I think of that reform then as having two tracks rules, changing the church state rules, new principles called charitable choice that were put into that welfare reform law, and then other laws. And then uh, with the George W. Bush administration and following those principles put into so-called equal treatment regulations that uh, apply across federal funding agencies. And with those rules, faith-based organizations can take part as faith-based organizations, not just beneficiaries are protected from religious discrimination and uh, religious coercion. Well, that was one part, kind of changing these church state rules. The other part, uh, the more visible part, was uh, in part symbolized by institutions, the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives, started by George W. Bush, uh, Centers for Faith-Based and Neighborhood, uh, sorry, for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives, all those now called Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, um, and those centers in the dozen federal aid funding for various social services. And this White House office and these centers in the agencies that actually do the funding and program design, uh, these were designed to carry forth that partnership vision, put it into practice by monitoring what the federal agency does, monitoring its rules. Did they actually comply with these changes that were supposed to happen. Um, a different attitude about pure uh, co-creation, can there be discussion, pilot projects, uh, outreach to community-based and faith-based organizations instead of just waiting for who comes to the table, um, outreach to partners that had thought they had no place at the table because they were too small, uh, because they didn't have a team of grant writers to impress awards committees and so on. And even inviting in actual congregations this is often indispensable services in uh, various neighborhoods. So uh, here's, a, I think, an era of openness to religious organizations, to community-based organizations, uh, kind of space for their distinctives to flourish and to be brought to the table, to be brought as part of the services that would be uh, openness to holistic and relation in a local focus. I think bringing ground exactly 
faith-based organizations and community-based organizations different from government-specified operated programs. So to me, that's the faith-based initiative. Now, um, and that basic set of rules and that set of federal institutions and a lot of those has all been maintained in some fashion through starting in the Clinton years and then with the Bush administration, Obama administration, even through the Trump administration in a somewhat different way and now into the Biden administration. Some people thought all this kind of disappeared in the end of the Obama years because there wasn't the same White House office during the Trump years. But this, there's been a lot of continuity over time in principles, rules, uh, some practices and institutions. Yet, what's in ways the whole effort has become muted and even transmuted, if I could say that. Almost a reversal I think has taken place in what was supposed to be happening. Um, rather than officials reaching out to see how to build partnerships, to co-create, to draw on the strengths of local connections and trust, the outreach from the government, federal government to organizations seems mainly intended to enlist those organizations as cheerleaders for the particular administration then in broad political and ideological agenda. That's not all that's going on, but a lot of that is happening. So not so much, how can we reach out and find a way to partnership in creative ways, but how can we support for the things that we do as a government? I think that's not so healthy. And then rather than continue to press for reforms that make it easier for unconventional partners uh, and businesses to be funded, too much seems to have become the new quo. Uh, standardized services, top-down, secular, size fits all, non-relational, deficit filling rather than building on assets. So obviously this is just kind of tarring with a broad broad brush, but brush, but I just think the flow has kind of changed rather than, uh, top down rather than side by side again. I think that's kind of the way things have gone. So I want to just give one example and then just those two recommendations. Uh, two months ago, USAID, Agency for International Development, does refugee resettlement as well as overseas relief and development, unveiled a document that some of you probably saw, Building Bridges in Development, uh, USAID's Strategic Religious Engagement Policy, and outlining this, this new policy for the agency. Uh, and in the introduction and in the document itself, a very words about how important strong religious engagement is for the success of USAID's development efforts, its resettlement efforts, because many of the organizations and leaders cru crucial for economic and social development are religious. They are trusted, uh, they're local, they're committed to the long term, they're dedicated to personal and holistic help to the most needy, and so on. So if the USAID is spending its money and running its programs is going to have maximal has to connect with uh, faith leaders, faith-based organizations, both here domestically and, and abroad. So in this document, I think two broad commitments were, were uh, promised. One of them is training internally for USAID staff on the importance of partnering with faith-based organizations and religious leaders, and then how to do that appropriately. All right, so internally, we're going to train, we're going to reassure people this is to do, but don't go running to the lawyers as soon as a faith-based organization applies for funding because they're perfectly legitimate for them to be at the table. And it's there are ways to do this and you should be doing it. Pushing away uh, myths and mistaken fears based on misreading constitutional guidelines. So that was one emphasis in there. How community, community organizations, faith-based organizations, new determination to expand partnerships with religious organizations and then also with locally focused organizations. That is, USAID want to be kind of closed in on itself or working with big secular organizations or whatever, but to really reach out to community-based and faith-based, uh, to invite them into partnership uh, organizations that thought they had no place at the table. Well, this should sound to you like what I said was a vision and the new policies and practices of the faith and indeed, 
exactly what they are. But that was the new policies and practices when the Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives was created at USAID in 2002. That's just over two decades ago. For two decades, this was to be what USAID has been. And the same thing for this, the agencies, the centers that it had and health human services and so on and so on. Why would it be 20 years later that this has to be adopted as a new policy? So I'm I'm both have that kind of refreshed as we know do. That's wonderful, but it's tragic that something that should have been building and building and building for two decades seems to have to have been rediscovered and then now committed to as if it's a brand new thing. I think that tells you both what the faith-based initiative has been and how it's declined, also what the vision is. And, and there are cases in federal this administration, the last one, where that vision is still alive, and uh, but it also has suffered, I think, uh, a lot of and tears. So just two suggestions then. Um, when interacting with federal agencies such as USAID, HHS, HUD, and I would suggest always what the particular center for faith-based and, and neighborhood partnerships in that agency is playing. And with the programs that you're talking with officials about, do they know what's going on? Do they know about your presence? Are they a discussion partner? This is one way of energizing them and helping them to show their importance to their own agency, and then also enlisting them as a support for your work. You need some more space. Things are too prescriptive. Just something, whatever. This particular ought to be a place you could talk with. So push to see if they're involved and try to get them involved if they're not. So that's the first recommendation. Second one is, I think this partnership vision, this is about improved services, better use of federal dollars, backsliding to traditional government ways of operating. I don't think that's been good for effective services. It's not good for private organizations that work with the government. So I, Alice, become an advocate for a renewal, refreshing of the faith-based initiative, the other things that you do in your advocacy with government. So John, I talked longer than you wanted me to, but- <clears throat> no. <laughs> no, you can never talk too long for me. And uh, thank you, Stan, and uh, thanks to all of you uh, for having us. It's an honor uh, to be with LSA because uh, what your network does and has done over so many years is nothing short of a miracle as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, you know, bless you uh, for, for that work, for sure. Let me take a slightly different tack. Stan's given you the authoritative overview of how the faith-based initiative arose, persisted, and has changed, and also the challenges that it now faces and the need for uh, renewal, and also some, I think, pretty uh, concrete and significant guidelines about how to think about it and approach it. But let me take a slightly different uh, tack and talk about, you know, ideas matter in policy and public affairs. And the ideas that have been addressed and some of them reified, some of them cleared out of the way over the past 25 or 30 years. I want to start just very briefly with uh, back in 1994, a wonderful book was published by actually someone who looks younger than me, but was actually a mentor of mine in graduate school, Robert Putnam, uh, wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And the basic thesis of the book was that America's so-called social capital, reciprocity, trust, the things that enable us to come together, to learn and lead together for human well-being and so forth, that these things were in decline as by all sorts of measures. Um, and it was a pretty it was a pretty bracing thesis that uh, got a lot of attention. Uh, but as a friend and colleague of Professor Putnam's, I, I reached out to him and said, you know, it's a wonderful book. It's obviously a bestseller. And but what about religion? And there wasn't a whole lot of attention to religion in that book. People are bowling alone. But are they still praying together <laughs> was the way I put it to him. And he began to look at that question and he had two of the well, a couple of the conventional objections or question marks that were in the air. Again, we're back in the early to mid 1990s. One was that, well, maybe religions out there doing a whole lot of stuff, sacred places, serving civic purposes, but 
don't they actually do that in a way that is bonding social capital rather than bridging social capital? In other words, don't they serve predominantly their own congregants, their own people who profess what they profess, people who are members? Uh, so it's bonding, not bridging social capital. And uh, the second objection kind of or, or question mark was, are they really all that big? I mean, we know there are certain big ones out there, you know, Catholic charities and whatnot. But, you know, what's really at the grassroots level? Well, in short, both of those questions were pretty, uh, by academic standards at, at least, uh, answered with a great, uh, great speed. Um, the former answered by Bob himself in a group he, group he pulled together that ended up publishing a series of reports called Better Together Reports, which basically concluded not only was religion in America a major and positive pro-civic, pro-social force with respect to social capital, but that in effect more than, as he calculated it and characterized it, more than half of all social capital was in effect spiritual capital, that houses of worship, churches, synagogues, mosques, parachurch organizations, church networks, community serving religious organizations, local, national, and so forth, that these were basically the bedrocks of social capital in America, the repositories of the most important and durable forms of social capital. Uh, so that was answered pretty much by Professor Putnam. The other question about the actual size and scope was answered by a number of scholars, including my, uh, I was then at, I was not then at uh, Penn, but I joined him at Penn some years later. I was at Princeton when Professor Ram Kanan, uh, Israeli-born professor of social work, wrote a series of, of studies uh, based on massive uh, survey research and uh, of congregations in Philadelphia and other cities. The work of, of Stan's a great friend and uh, the great uh, late great uh, scholar Calvin College, Stephen Monsma, who had done studies of faith-based welfare uh, organizations in a number of cities. All of these data came back and said essentially two things, that these places are not only out there, not only the big ones, but just networks of small community serving uh, churches, synagogues, mosques, parachurch organizations, and they're providing substantial portions of more than 200 different kinds of social services in America. And that without them, it would be almost inconceivable uh, how we would get that job done. That was really Kanan's point, that in Europe, you had kind of the socialist welfare state cradle to grave, but in America, we had filled this space over, over the years organically, as it were, with faith-based organizations. So uh, Stan gave, a, as I say, an incredible recitation overview of how government and policy uh, responded to this. Faith-based from the very beginning was fact-based. It was driven by fact. I mean, it was driven by desire and passion and a desire to serve the public good. Uh, but it, it, there were, it, it had an intellectual foundation. The facts kind of suggested that whether you're a person of some faith or no faith, Methodist, Muslim, Mormon, Quaker, Catholic, Jew, Jehovah's Witness, atheist, agnostic, didn't matter. If you're interested in providing social services and improving the life prospects of fellow Americans, especially the most vulnerable and needy, you would want to have all institutions, including government, effect partnerships with religious organizations to grow and expand. Uh, so, and, and that really won the day. I think the charitable choice uh, uh, provision, section 104 of that uh, 1996 uh, welfare bill that, that Stan referenced, I think the fact that uh, President Clinton and actually the first real faith-based initiative center, I would say, in the federal government was at HUD under uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo, who was then the secretary of HUD. Um, the Bush, uh, George W. Bush, obviously, uh, administration. And then the fact that President Obama, when he became, when, when Senator Obama became President Obama, sustained that, changed the name, uh, changed some of the focus, but really did sustain it. I think it tells you that uh, those ideas, those facts actually uh, persuaded a lot of people. Now let's cut the camera very quickly to the moment, the present moment, and what's happened in the interim. I'm not suggesting that this is part of what's behind what Stan referred to as the decline or the challenges facing uh, faith-based and community initiatives or partnerships or neighborhood partnerships. But I think it's, I think it's probably there somewhere in the mix. Um, today, we talk about the rise of nuns, not the kind of nuns who taught me, uh, the Immaculate Heart of Mary sisters, but the N-O-N-E-S nuns, the radical increase in the fraction of all Americans who are not religiously affiliated, who either just de decoupled, uh, some people call it the de-churching of America. Uh, the data are clear. This is not a uh, artifact of some 
bad measurement or sort of poor survey research, there is a what some of my uh, what the uh, what David Campbell at the University of uh, Notre Dame refers to as the secular surge, that about 25 to 35 percent of all Americans are not merely no longer religiously affiliated, but affirmatively and positively secular. Doesn't mean they're hostile to religion, but it means they have really you know, they they don't it, religion is not a significant part of their lives, and they have an affirmative worldview that is A to Z secular. Okay. Um, the rise of the nuns, uh, also the rise of political polarization, in which many people point the finger at religion, writ large or religious organizations, and perhaps in some ways rightfully so. We all know that religion is a great, can be a great tonic, right? Religion can bring people together. It can, it can spur mutual support and volunteerism and, and so forth. But religion can also be toxic. It could also be uh, a toxin. Uh, depending on what kind of religion it is and, and who's professing what and, and how they're going about it. So there has been a, and, and that in addition to a number of, you know, the Catholic Church sex abuse scandals and whatnot, there has been a, a kind of a, religion is a less popular now, not only less adhered to than it was. And so anything that is religion or faith or faith-based has more of a question mark over its head than it did 25 or 30 years ago. What does all that mean for, you know, back down to earth, the policy, the practice, and an organization like the amazing LSA? What I think it means is uh, just keep on keeping on. People still respond when you're problem focused. I noticed that in the recitation that began uh, uh, this uh, wonderful gathering was referred to in particular the elder care services and whatnot, right? This, when you start by discussing problems, when you put the problem, whether it's the need to mentor the children of prisoners or whether it's the need to provide better and more adequate homeless uh, care for you know, care for homeless people and homeless shelters, or whether it's the need to provide intergenerational or other forms of elder care, uh, home care, fo focusing on the problem still wins the day. Still, in people who are skeptical, doubtful, whether they're in whether they're in the House or Senate. Uh, or whether they're in other organizations or the public at large or corporations. When you start talking about faith-based uh, organizations, sacred places serving civic purposes in relation to particular problems, particular social needs, unmet social needs, and you talk about it in terms of partnerships, right? Uh, it, 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 there's nothing sectarian about it. Uh, and it is bridging social capital. You know, I don't, I don't know that uh, Lutheran, uh, services in America. I don't know if you stop and say, oh, excuse me, are you Lutheran before I, we, uh, uh, oh, 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 you're not Lutheran? Well, we'll move to the next, uh, you know, keep ringing the doorbell until you come. To no, of course not. And we know that the vast majority, as, as the aforementioned Stephen Monsma showed, the vast majority of people who receive, again, scores and scores of different kinds of services from religious community serving organizations and others, the people are not, by and large, members of the church, the congregation, the sect, whatever, that serves them. And that fact, which has been hiding in plain view for decades, is probably the single most significant fact with respect to advancing the cause or winning over skeptics or at least neutralizing opposition. The final thing I'll say is, though, it's about also, right, getting people who are not unsympathetic, would like to see uh, greater partnerships and support uh, getting them uh, galvanized and mobilized to do that. Um, we were fortunate back in the 90s because there were a lot of people who were paying attention, including uh, the governor of Texas and uh, the vice president of the United States, Al Gore. They, they had almost identical visions in some ways of what this should be. I mean, Gore spoke about paramedics of civil society and you know, Bush spoke about the armies of compassion, but they were essentially the same thing. And uh, today we have, I think, still people up on Capitol Hill who might not agree about a whole lot of other things, but do agree on solving problems and using partnerships and having cross-sector collaborations, including and involving even centrally religious uh, nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, uh, from a J.D. Vance to, a, to an Elizabeth Warren, for that matter. And uh, so I, I would just end by saying I'm, I'm actually hopeful and optimistic that if we can just survive 2024 in one piece, uh, <laughs> that when we get to the end of it in 2025, 
uh, we may see exactly the kind of revitalization of faith-based initiatives and community serving uh, operations and, and problem solving programs that Stan, is, Stan talked about. So I'll turn my motor off there. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And I think um, now we can take some questions in the chat. I've got a couple right here that have come to me and feel free to um, you know, place your question in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, I think that uh, one of the the first ones, um, you know, John and Stanley, uh, particularly in the Lutheran Services and American Network, over 200 of our 300 members at Lutheran Services do work in aging services and supports. And it can really feel like no one is paying attention to the aging of the U.S. population and the incredible unmet needs in this space. So focusing on that problem that you talked about. Um, but, you know, what are your views on this policy area and how we can get more federal attention to this issue that reflects our faith based view that all people should be able to age with dignity and choice in, in their home and community? Yeah, that's it's such a good question. And I hope John has a really good. I, I think it's just very puzzling way, uh, given the supposed um, dominant uh, role for so long of boomers and the fact that they're we're all retiring and we all mean and, you know, yet there's so little concrete attention uh, to this. Um, and, and you know, here's a place where, where faith-based and place-based is just critical. The desire of people to be in their own neighborhood and even in their own house with their own religious community among people that they trust and who have a concern for, as they do for their, you know, kind of like their eternal, what's going to happen to me and and all of that, and that this is uh, being so poorly responded to. Um, I, I don't I really don't know the answer. I, I will say I have seen in the VA system uh, some creative uh, new ways of responding needs that uh, of you know uh, aging uh, uh, veterans. So I have a brother-in-law who is able to be in a, a VA medical foster care home, which is a <clears throat> private home with trained people um, who are looking after him. I think that's very innovative. It's partly federal, partly state. Um, but here is here is such a large sector of the population. Uh, a lot of people who are professionals, they're lawmakers, they're administrators, and you would think that this would be right at the forefront, and I just don't see that. I agree, Stan, and uh, I, I happen to have a little bit of uh, knowledge expertise on this, uh, which comes about, which I'll very, very quickly say, it comes about in a very odd way. I got sick in 2014, and uh, as I came back, I didn't know I was going to uh, continue teaching, but I was running this program, which then uh, became kind of a uh, internationalized, and I ended up uh, spending a uh, better part of three years going back and forth to China, studying China's elder care crisis, <laughs> and it is a crisis. They're on the way to a half a billion uh, people over age 60 uh, right after the middle of the century, 21st century, and it's it's unbelievable uh, challenge uh, there. Um, but one of the interesting things was one of the things, what they were interested in hearing a lot about were programs in America like our you know program for the all-inclusive care of the elderly, the PACE programs that are operated in partnership with a lot of religious organizations, and the fact that, you know, like in Philadelphia, uh, the late, great Rita Ungaro Shabone had an incredible organization which was bringing basically to elderly shut-ins in Philadelphia, tens of thousands of them, that her organization, you know, just very quietly, very strongly, but over a number of years, filled this incredible need that wasn't being filled by any city agency. It wasn't on the top of the agenda of any of the major foundations or philanthropies. But I think, you know, when I look at the situation in America, part of the issue might be, part of the problem might be that the major voices on issues affecting the elderly tend to tend to go to Social Security and Medicare and, you know, and making sure benefits are there, and, and which is good, I agree, which I, you know, which I'm all for, but less about the actual where the rubber meets the road day to day outreach care you know, home care, preventive care, 
uh, and frankly, palliative care of, 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 of elderly persons who are, especially those who are sick or alone or poor, right? I mean, that population, that subpopulation of the, some elderly are doing just fine, but we have all these different populations between those that are, are healthy and well and well off financially and have people around them, friends and family, and those who are isolated and not well. So I think it has not been uh, the, well, so many organizations like LSA do this incredible work, and yet there hasn't really been a broad coalition coming together, say the way there had been over the years among faith-based groups on issues of, say, welfare uh, reform right. or anti-poverty programs. That hasn't happened yet, uh, or at least I haven't seen it happen on, on questions of elder care and the elderly. Thank you for that, John. Yeah, we've been really talking about how can we drive that narrative in your observation that there's actually a gap in that narrative is really yeah. um, insightful. So uh, thank you. Could, I think we have, sorry, go could, ahead. Could I just add one comment? Mm -hmm. Just strikes me, this is, there's some things that are kind of system-wide. So there's, you know, Medicare and Medicaid mm -hmm. and and a little bit of support for long insurance and, um, and so, but so much of that actual, the done and that need to be done are very decentralized and um, not not at all standardized. So in, in, a, in a certain sense, that government's heart doesn't get its hands easily. It's easier for the government to think about something that you could have, you know, 100,000 units that are all kind of the same. And then we can say, well, every state gets a bunch of them. So uh, th this seems like the kind of thing that needs to be kind of from the bottom up uh, coalition people saying this is what we're doing, but we can't do it without more resources. And so letting the policy, as it were, kind of be developed from the bottom up and then get buy-in from the top down, the down to come up with it might be important. Thank you for that. Um, Linda, I think you have a question. Linda Timmons, I think you're on my Zoom screen. I do. Thank you, Alicia. And I think it, it ties in nicely to the topic we've just been discussing. Because as faith-based nonprofit organizations, we really play a critical role, I believe, in creating innovative solutions. And we do that on slim operating margins or through charitable dollars. So how can we more effectively highlight the innovative work of the faith-based sector to policymakers and others? Mm, wow. TikTok. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, you know, um, it, it, John's in his comment made a point, and I think rightly so, of the reality that faith-based organizations just don't spend energy on converts or pushing religion to them. Uh, important, but I I'm a little bit worried that um, the success of uh, saying we're ecumenical, we're, we're not here to make converts and so on, in a way has kind of um, uh, made, it, made it a little bit too easy for outsiders to look at faith-based organizations as mm. not really faith-based. So it's, it's just like it's a, a little bit different brand, something like that. And to not really realize that mm. this is actually a faith-based organization, it's centered in a faith community. It draws resources from all these people, these volunteers and, and networks and all those kinds of things. And it actually does come out of a particular variety. It's a particular brand. It has its own energy, its own passion. Distinctive asset that ought to be paid attention to and cultivated. Uh, but when it does work with people, it doesn't force itself on them, you know, as it were. But but it is a distinctive kind of thing. I think both things have to be to the public that you're distinctively faith rooted. That means a lot. That's that's why you could do what you're doing. Um, that doesn't you know put people in the back, and refuse to serve them, something like that. But uh, I think if we're not careful. I, I I've thought for years that um, the as it were every faith-based organization ought to have a kind of like a lighthouse on top that shines a light out saying, this is who we are. So we're, we're buddy, this is our light. This is who we are. This is a organization. And we want you to know that. 
not to keep you away, but so you know why we do what we do and how. We... And Linda, I would say, thank you, Stan. I, and I, I think, Linda, I would just say, I'm going to see if I can put this in this uh, particular Advent season the right way. Let me see if I can figure out a way to put this. So humility is supposedly one of the great Christian virtues, right? Uh, I like to say if I had humility, I'd be perfect. But, uh, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but humility is, is a great virtue, but faith-based organizations, and I'm not talking just about the little ones. I'm talking about even the big ones. I had the experience back in the uh, 90s of being a part of a major research intermediary organization that studied community serving programs of various kinds on various issues around the country. And it occurred to me as I looked at them that those that were secular, predominantly secular, entirely secular, if they had, you know, an after school program that served 112 kids, mm -hmm. they'd have stuff out there and pamphlets. And, you know, you, you would think not that they were exaggerating, but, you know, they let it be known that they were there. They spent significant money on their public communications and letting the world know. <laughs> Look at these faith based organizations and there would be no such thing. They might have 500 kids or 600 kids. Or when you would survey them, the aforementioned Ram Kanan surveys, you'd say, uh, uh, some of it is it's lost in the translation. Do you have uh, any you know, major you know, youth mentoring programs? No, 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 we don't. Then you go there on uh, Thursday night and you see there's 400 kids there. Say, well, what is that? Oh, that's a discipleship program. Oh, okay. Discipleship. I, I understand. Uh, it's not meant, but it looks a lot like what Big Brothers, Big Sisters would call mentoring too, right? So there's a bit of a translation issue, but there's also something about the culture of faith-based organizations generally, and not just the Christian ones, but others as well, that makes them a little less ready, willing, and able to let the world know they're there to kind of blow their horn and to compete for resources with other organizations um, and, and frankly, in some, in some cases, the ecumenism that's most needed is when different faith-based organizations within the same, say, catchment area are doing the same things, coming together to partner to do them rather than being isolated so they can go together to whatever the foundation is, whatever the corporate giver is, whatever the government program might be. So that, that lines up nicely with, um, uh, a question here from Ruben Rotman, who's um, on the Zoom screen here as well. Um, do you think there would be more power and receptivity if there were multi-faith coalition efforts in dialogue with government as opposed to working independently? Yeah. John, so I'll say yes. You can say yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> I so I do, um, among other things, uh, religious freedom work. We always make sure it's inter interfaith, ecumenical, uh, multi-faith. Why? Because that shows it's a principle, right? And I think uh, same thing with this. There is suspicion in people's minds. It's this religious group that's trying to get money. That's probably to make themselves bigger. They can, you know, whatever. Uh, to come together with others, I think, helps to emphasize that you're together focused on this social problem. You're filling the seed. Um, you can respect each other in the different ways of doing it and different motivations and so on, but you are in it together and testifying uh, those people. And of course, those you're addressing, uh, they probably have multiple different faith backgrounds and different ideas. Also, we used to talk well, about yeah. we used to talk about you know faith-based organizations and everything gets an acronym or gets a short you know short short circuited uh, acronym and FBOs FBOs. I used to talk about IFBOs, interfaith-based uh, organizations, and the IFBOs are more politically effective. There's no question. I don't know. I don't have the. I don't know that anyone's done a systematic study of it, but I would bet you, if you could and you did, you would find from the even the natural experiments and the data that IFBOs at the margin get heard more quickly, get, get you know more receptivity. It just stands to reason, right? But it also is extremely important. Uh, especially now in this era of polarization, where people are sensitive and looking to uh, organizations and institutions that seem to be able to be part of, uh, call it democratic renewal, call it civic mm -hmm. renewal, what you like. But the religious communities really can and should be not only prophetic voices in leading that, but also by, by practicing what they preach and doing it together. 
what what is a what what is a more what could be a more powerful witness to wanting to really help people regardless of you know all god's children by coming together in in an interfaith coalition it's it's easier said than done i will also tell you that i know stan would agree a lot of efforts were made uh, even going back to the 90s for groups to come and partner together and cross lace and Sometimes there are people within the various different, you know, organizations that don't want uh, that partnership for whatever uh, reasons, theological, historical, or maybe even sometimes personal chemistry issues. So it's not easy, but I was on a, 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 a call yesterday with Ibu Patel of Interfaith America, uh, who's done a lot of incredible work, and he has an initiative now called The Vote is Sacred, and getting religious organizations involved in that uh, domain uh, across different faith lines. So I, I think it's really important. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Wonderful. And I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that Ruben is part of um, one of our partners at the Interfaith Roundtable and is from the Network of Jewish Human Services Agencies. So a strong, strong collaborator. And, uh, you know, Ruben, I, I really appreciated your question because it was so ethnic to who you are. He, he's always um, reaching out and really thinking about that global. And, you know, we like well, to say our faith is our center, not our boundary, right? There you and go. So yep. kind of the why. I'm sorry, Jeff, welcome, did you? Welcome, welcome from the Penn Hill L. Uh, as the non-Jewish uh, member of the board of Penn Hillel. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We need you. Thank you. I'm there. Mm -hmm. It's been a rough couple of weeks, uh, but we're there. <laughs> oh, yes, it has. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Um, you know, who, um, you know, I got a question here in the chat privately that says, ask John, who are some of the high level leaders he knows who really get this and who we should really think of as allies? Would you be willing to share, John? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, this is going to sound uh, like a dodge of that question. And Dan, I'm sure, has even better ideas on it. So I won't let him off the hook. But I actually it, it is amazing to me that we have uh, two uh, presidents who served back to back. Uh, President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama, um, who I guess now by in, by some renderings are two peas in a pod compared to perhaps what, what followed, but uh, they're not. Uh, they differ fundamentally on things, and yet they were really aren't really truly pretty much as one on this issue. And over the last many years, they have on occasion come together and plucked notes about the faith-based initiative and faith-based in neighborhood or community partnerships. And it would be my, I would certainly think that, uh, and I had hoped for this, frankly, going into uh, 2020 uh, and uh, into the new administration, that somehow this would, the kind of reinvigorated initiative that Stan's talking about would come from, you know, the two former presidents coming together on this. They have come together on things. So the so-called COVID collaborative, for example, brought them together. Uh, they're together on this uh, group called More Perfect, which is about democratic renewal and constitutional reform and so forth. But, but on this particular issue, I would think that the place that I would like to go first or look to first would be uh, those two those two former presidents. But then on Capitol Hill, uh, I really think that there are a lot of strange bedfellows coalitions there. I mean, I mentioned J.D. Vance and I mentioned Elizabeth Warren. You think, oh, these two people have nothing in common. Well, they just did a bill together on you know, Wall Street, uh, whatever you might, whatever the pros and cons of that might be. There was for many years, and I think there still is, a, I don't know, quite as, quite as active, a Senate prayer. You know, Senate members of the Senate would meet together to pray. President uh, Senator Obama was a part of that. Um, and I, and I also, you know, I mean, uh, maybe a dating myself, but if you go and look at in, in the book that uh, you are kind enough to mention, the Godly Republic book from I guess, 2007 now, I quote uh, a bunch, I have a bunch of quotes from different political leaders and it's kind of challenging. Who do you, who do you think said this? And it turned out they were all Hillary Clinton <laughs> and they were all just, you could have thought it was George W. Bush. People did. But there's a lot more agreement out there for, from leaders of the past, I think some leaders uh, of the present. Um, and the last thing I would just say is it would be really a good thing to survey uh, co corporate America, uh, the leaders of, of America's uh, top corporations, the top 100, 200, whatever, uh, 
because the the one area, the one nut that was never cracked, right, was and there's a lot of faith, there's a lot of leaders in corporate America who get it, understand it, but uh, the importance of faith based, but they they have portfolios that basically wall themselves off from giving to religious organizations. They don't want to give to this group because I don't want to give to the Lutherans because I might offend somebody else. I want to give to them because I might offend somebody else. They're pretty much wrong about that. President George W. Bush gave a speech in May of 2001 directed at this question. It was a, it was a, I actually delivered at University of Notre Dame and it had, it made some ripples, but it never really went anywhere. And so I think there's a lot of latent leadership on this issue in a place you might not normally think to look, which is in the suites of big corporations. Because once you get those folks aboard and you have enough residual support even in government, things can really start to move again and change. But Stan, you know better. Well, Stan, Stan's I, more I up to date on everything than me, by the way. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. John's better acted than I am. Uh, I just wanted to th throw in a, a word for state and local because they are much closer to where things actually happen. And so in places you might not expect very blue uh, for example, there's kind of a revival of interest in faith-based because of COVID and are in the communities that didn't listen to government, but serving people, it was faith communities, faith leaders. And so um, there's been a, a connection and there are people that you might not like. There's a thriving faith initiative. The, the mayor's office. They have to actually done things they have to make done, and there are things that faith-based organizations are involved in. And so, to kind of think about this from the side, you know, where services are being delivered, being contracted for, and so on, and then kind of see who around that is interested governor who's interested um, I think that's also a way to very helpful thank you it reminds me of an article we saw grant makers of effective organizations that basically said if you know 30 to 40 percent of the sector is provided supported by faith-based and only two percent of foundations give to faith-based they're missing a huge opportunity and that was actually something I in a conversation this year so maybe we're getting to that point that you're talking about Stanley of a refresh and a reaffirm and um, you've really given us some great ideas on you know what our role is in helping advance that conversation um, and the many unrealized opportunities and levers to really think about as we strengthen the public and private partnerships and retain our faith identity um, towards that you know that shared service uh, commitment of servicing community and advancing health and opportunity for all. So thank you so much. It was an honor and a privilege to have you both here this afternoon with us. And um, thank you everyone in the Zoom room that, that joined us and um, very strengthened and energized by the, um, the, the advice and the, the recognition of the, of the work that's done across the, the country and by our faith-based partners. So thank you, uh, Stanley and John. And thank you, Kent thank Mitchell, you. for pulling this together. Yeah, yes. <laughs> thank you all. Sure thank you. Thank we'll you. see you guys. Go, Take care. Go LSA. Go LSA. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Uh,